That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be asked to come along. I'm uh, very much the, the black sheep of the family. Uh, my mother was a head teacher at a primary school. My daughter, uh, she's currently a teacher in a primary school, and I escaped the school environment and ended up in the university instead. But the, the family are interested in education, all, always have been. Um, son accepted. He likes to do community theatre, hates the idea of education, hates the idea of, of teaching. So we've got a bit of everything in our family, a bit of... Um, range of perspectives in what education could and should be in terms of children's lives and I want to start off that by just making it clear about where I stand. My job today is to give you the big picture, the broader picture of what poverty in Scotland is and make that connection between education. You're sharply focused on the attainment challenge, but attainment challenge is part of something much bigger and the presentation then touches upon what that bigger picture is and gives a, a sense of connection and an identification of problems uh, that lie ahead uh, in doing the work that you want to do. Five hidden poverties I'm going to talk about today and I'm going to leave you with three questions uh, by way of a conclusion. So where I stand then, where I uh, come from, he's going the wrong way. It is, but I'm Many apologies. So I grew up in this wee place, a Sc uh, Scottish index of multiple deprivation maps, now out of date because the last iteration was released last week and I'm lazy and didn't update the slides. Mm -hmm. uh, truth is that the maps aren't updated yet. I grew up in a, a place called Kilwinning uh, in North Ayrshire. Uh, it's a new town estate. It uh, was and has been since its inception considered to be a deprived area, although at the point of inception when it was built it was for you know, forward-thinking families from Glasgow that were coming to avail themselves of the economic opportunities in the new town. Today, it's uh, one of Scotland's uh, most deprived areas, according to the uh, Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. Uh, fast forward, I now live in a little village called Plains. Uh, Plains is outside Airdrie. It's an ex-mining community. According to that map, I currently live in one of Scotland's 20%, in fact, 10% most deprived areas in the particular um, uh, data zone in which I live. So my life has been living in a, in a mixed environment, one in which I have been fortunate enough to have parents that have inspired me, parents who understand the value of education, but also a rounded education, not just a little bit of paper and a, a formal qualification. But I've been part of broader communities in which a, a range of educational outcomes have happened by my friends, peers, families, and my, my children likewise. The current status that I find myself in is quite interesting and I think it's pertinent to many in the room. I currently then am considered to be living in one of Scotland's most deprived areas. I'm a university professor, my, work, my wife works full time as a graphic designer, senior graphic designer with the council. Uh, my daughter, if she were to be afforded opportunities because of living in a deprived area, might gain advantages that she should not. There are problems with the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation that those from rural areas are, are very much aware of. It's a very useful tool, but as a useful tool it has to be used appropriately. And I think sometimes, particularly in a rural context, it doesn't serve as well and we perhaps misuse, misunderstand what its purpose is. So part of the, the, the issues of hidden poverty is understanding what the data are telling us and indeed uh, making sure that we don't confuse matters. Like anybody, you can take a range of positions in poverty and you, you'll, you'll position yourself uh, according to one of those four bullet points. You may think it's not a problem um, and simply it's always been there, always will be, let's just get on with it, let's not get too stressed about it. Or you may perceive it to be a problem. But if you perceive it to be a problem, the nature of that problem might be viewed very differently by different people. So on one end of the spectrum, there are those who blame the poor people for the circumstances in which they find themselves. Uh, your Daily Mail arguments, uh, your OK magazines from time to time, your, your poverty porn TV. Let's look at somebody, let's almost laugh at somebody, and let's think about the poor decisions that they've made that have led them to find themselves in the circumstances they live in. The other end of the spectrum are those that say, well, it's nothing to do with individual choice. It's all to do with the system, the, the welfare system, the way the economy works, hidden powers that are keeping people poor. A very different view of the problem, but nevertheless seeing poverty as a problem in itself. Somewhere in between, there are those that think, well, the problem is we're not doing enough with the resources at our disposal. Our anti-poverty interventions are simply not effective enough. It's not necessarily that people are to blame. It's not necessarily that there's hidden hands that are keeping people down. We're just not doing the right things with the resources at our disposal. And probably that's where I lie, on that spectrum of possibility of how you view poverty. This is how I view the world. I view the world that... Well, to some extent, people make poor decisions and to some extent, systems make it more difficult for people to achieve. There's a lot that we can do to make the world a better place if we make the more better use of the resources at our disposal. 
And one of those resources, of course, is the, the, the work that's done through the attainment challenge, through PEF funding and other, other forms of intervention. And I see that as a view of an optimist, because I believe if we do better with what we have, then we can make a positive difference. We're not saying there's nothing we can do, people will make poor decisions. There's nothing we can do, the system will always keep people down. I, I think the things that we can do, collective responsibility uh, across the board. So I view poverty as this. You may or you may not disagree. I'm not here to convince you, really. You, you, you know, you, I'm here to get you to think about the issues and understand how other people view poverty in relation to your, your professional practice. I think it's a waste of opportunity. I, I'd guess that attainment challenge is at its core. You know, it's a waste of opportunity because poverty doesn't allow children to gain the most of the educational opportunities that are there. It's certainly a waste of money. Um, you might even argue that attainment challenge is money that doesn't need to be spent if poverty wasn't a problem. Because the poverties that are presenting through, uh, or that have been addressed through the attainment challenge, and you know, many of them have at the root cause uh, family poverty. If we didn't have poverty, we wouldn't have to spend to address that problem. I'm not trying to do you a job and try to get rid of your wage, but perhaps there are other ways in which your endeavours would be better spent rather than fundamentally dealing with the implications of, 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 of an ineffective system that, that, that's not allowing people to, um, to realise their potential. Poverty is a condition that some people choose. Now, I actually agree that that's the case. Um, Franciscan monks, for example, they choose a vow of poverty. It's not the usual suspects. People tend to think that, oh, that, you know, they're making bad decisions, you know, they're, they're living life on largesse and welfare. The reality, the evidence, the, the work that Sarah's organisation does time and time again proves that's not the case. People don't choose to be poor. They don't choose a life in welfare because it's a life of luxury. The only people that choose poverty are those that do it for religious reasons. Uh, pick, taking a vow of poverty is not something that people choose. It's something that happens to people for a variety of complex reasons, um, and it's one of the great myths that we have to challenge. Well, this chap, however, uh, Lewis Hamilton, last year, uh, one of our elite sports persons, one of the idols many of your young people in schools may look up to. Certainly my grandson does, who's a bit of a petrol head even at four years old. Uh, this would be on his uh, list of people to admire. When he was getting nominated for the Sports Personality of the Year, last year, not this year, um, he made reference to growing up in the Stevenage slums. And his point was that growing up in a tough environment helped stimulate him, inspire him to be the success that he was. I grew up in a crap place. I didn't want a life like that. I worked harder and I achieved. And that thinking, that, that logic is something that we hear time and time again. There was considerable backlash from Stevenage, one that arguing it wasn't a slum, and two arguing that actually Lewis Hamilton wasn't poor when he was growing up anyway. And so in many great, many um, points, that argument was fundamentally flawed. But it's an important way of thinking that many people believe that poverty might make you successful. And many Scottish professional footballers, for example, tell the narrative of growing up in a tough place, but thank goodness, because it made me successful. And those ways of thinking that poverty is not a problem, I think, are things that we have to understand and be prepared to counter in our work. And poverty can mean many different things, and it might mean no imp positive impact. You, you might argue there's the odd case. Maybe there is an individual that is inspired and works harder and does achieve. The no impact thing is really important, because for many children, poverty doesn't have an impact. And it doesn't have an impact because of the work that you do and the work that other professionals like you do. The social support systems we have in place, the way that an education system can work to support young people who experience poverty, if, if not eradicates, certainly ameliorates the impact of poverty. So it's not that poverty is not important, it's that we're doing things with resources at our disposal that is lessening the impact on children who are experiencing it. So for many ch children in Scotland today, poverty is not impacting upon them adversely because of the way in which we're investing our, our collective resources to support them. But more commonly, it's either got a hidden impact because parents are bearing the core one, hidden poverty, one of the themes of the talk, that parents are bearing the brunt of it and it doesn't present as much with children, or there are negative out outcomes for children in the here and now. We know that bullying remains an issue in schools and any head teacher that tells you bullying is not an issue is kidding their self on. It is an issue. It probably always will be to some extent. And that's not necessarily to throw our hands in the air and say nothing can be done. Uh, it's something that we always have to, to work to tackle bullying. And some bullying is on the, the, the grounds of not having the right gear. Uh, there was a wonderful programme a few years ago on a, a horrible issue by in Children's News Round called Right Trainers. So it was not just the fact that you didn't have trainers, it's that children weren't seen to be wearing the right trainers and were bullied on account of having the wrong labels uh, on, on their feet. 
So we know that your school uniform is not enough to prevent bullying, and depending on the, 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 the actual brand of the clothing you wear might be enough to distinguish you and for others to mock. Or of course, negative outcomes for tomorrow, which is very much the thinking of the, the attainment challenge, that by addressing some of the ways in which poverty impacts upon children today, we can prevent in the longer term some longer term impacts on children tomorrow. So in lots of ways, the, the impacting in the here and now, the hidden poverty, because parents bear the brunt of it, or trying to avoid the poverty tomorrow, it's all wrapped up in, in what we in the room are concerned with. So where are we at in Scotland, thinking about bigger, bigger picture? Well, we're not in a good place. Uh, uh, almost a quarter of a million children in Scotland just now are considered to be living in a household in which the family has an income that is so far below a typical income that they can purchase, uh, avail themselves of the things that a typical income is able to have. That's what we understand poverty to be. It's not having no money, it's having a level of income that's so far below a typical income that you simply can't take part to the degree which most people would consider to be reasonable. You can't afford the holiday, you can't afford the leisure, you barely f uh, um, afford the, the, the food, etc, etc. One quarter of a million children in Scotland are unfortunately projected to rise over the next few years. Not a good place. And that's a longer term trend and you'll see that you know it was a trend of improvement because we were making decisions for a long time in the UK and in Scotland it was leading to poverty being reduced but in more recent years we have been making decisions that have led to poverty increasing and those decisions are largely decisions that are re refer to taxation and, and welfare. Not exclusively but largely taxation and welfare which means that we're now in a negative trajectory. So at exactly the same time where you'd been tasked to narrow the attainment gap, we're finding that more children in Scotland are living in poverty. More children and a higher proportion of children are living in poverty. So you're narrowing the you're, you're tasked to reduce that gap when there are more children experiencing some of the root cause. And uh, again, one of the myths, two thirds of those children are living in a household in which at least one adult has at least some work. Only one third of children living in poverty in Scotland live in a household where no adult is working at the current time. So work is not a solution to poverty. You know, and us um, upskilling young people to get qualifications is not necessarily a guarantee that that young person as a young adult is going to live a life beyond poverty. If they're moving into precarious employment, if they're moving into low paid employment, then we're just offering them another form of poverty as an adult rather than a solution to it. I'm quite depressing so far, but I'll, I'll try and pick things up a wee bit as we move on. And it's a rural and an urban issue. We know it's more of an urban issue. There's no disputing the fact that Glasgow is a case apart. And this is, this is not a measure of poverty. This is a measure of something called children with limited resources. It's an experimental statistic. That's how it's described. So it's not robust enough that the government will commit to it, but it's indicative of the, the way in which families don't have enough resource. And it's interesting in that graph that, well, it's fairly familiar to us. You know, if you go to the right of the graph, you, graph, you get your Glasgow's, your Dundee's, your, your North Lanarkshire's. And if you go to the left of the graph with lower numbers, you get your Aberdeenshire's, your island authorities. But there are some quirks in there. There are some rural authorities that seem to be not doing so well. I mean, I wouldn't hold too much store on it. The point I'm trying to make is, wherever you are in Scotland, there is a proportion, to my mind, uh, an unacceptable proportion of young people that are living in poverty or are living in households with limited resources. Yes, it's a very big problem in Glasgow. Yes, it's a very big problem in Inverclyde and North Lanarkshire, but it's also a problem in more affluent authorities. It's one that we can't ignore. Uh, the length and breadth of Scotland, either in pockets or hidden dispersals, there are children living in poverty. And that's what Scotland looks like in 2019. Uh, I'm continuing this theme of misery. Um, for many there's precarious work, not for me, I'm lucky. I've got a full-time stable job and a decent income, but that's not the reality for many. For far too many, um, it's not the case. There is income poverty for many, even those that are people in Scotland just now working full-time, that are not through full-time work earning enough to live a life beyond poverty. To my mind, that's a national disgrace. I can't think in any way, shape or form how we could justify somebody working a full-time working week and not earning enough through that work to escape poverty. How we distribute our resources is fundamentally flawed. We know that food bank use is rising. Um, uh, in some respects, a problematic form of, of social support. It's not what we want for a country, but it's absolutely necessary for people that don't have, uh, have access to food. The social security system is evolving. We have now the Scottish system, which is maybe taking some of the worst excesses of cuts off the UK system. 
the local state is changing, and you know that more than any, and, and maybe for many of you, PEF money has been used to plug gaps of what was previously a core service. So rather than PEF money perhaps been used to be what it was intended, if you like, to, additional, to have that additional boost to tackle the fundamental causes of the attainment gap. In some cases, the PEF money has been used to plug other services that have been removed because of cuts to, to local budgets. And we can't kid ourselves on that's not a reality. Much more has been asked of the local state, uh, local um, state, local government at a time uh, when resource is being squeezed. And of course, we've got the political uncertainties just now, which you know could be famine or feast, nobody knows, but it's certainly uncertain what lies ahead for the next few years. Let's get that one, sorry. So, I think it's important we, we also think, if we're setting a broader context of what education is to Scotland, because to my mind, education is absolutely central to Scotland's sense of itself. It's not just a, another service. It's not just another thing that's part of the mix that happens to be done elsewhere that's better or worse. We somehow see it as fundamental to what we're about. We have this idea, perhaps it's a myth, but it's certainly a, a, a trope that we, that we um, are comfortable with of the ladder perts, and that is a ladder perts given the, you know, the, the time in which it was brought up, that if you have ability, then you will be given the opportunity in Scotland to achieve what you could be. We, we believe in that. We see that as not just something that's a, a service, but it's fundamental to what we are as a nation, that people with talent will be afforded the opportunity uh, to succeed. Provider of world-class education is something that we aspire to as well. It's not just a service we do, it's much more important to Scotland, I think, education. And devolution has led to some differences between Scotland and, and the UK, in, in many fields, and in education certainly one. We, of course, all have a different, a separate responsibility for education, but I think we can see a shift, a, a more marked shift over the devolution years in what our school education systems are about and what they're trying to achieve. Very different approaches to improving uh, aggregate results in England through um, excellence in, involved in, in um, some specialist funding for schools, academies and the like in England, which is not what we want up here in Scotland. But we also have a very strong anti-poverty sector, as well as <coughs> education being central to Scotland's sense of self. I think it's also the case that tackling poverty is central to Scotland's sense of self. We see ourselves as being socially just. I mean, again, back to Sarah's organisation, the Child Poverty Action Group, you've got the Poverty Alliance. These groups are listened to by Scottish Government. They are funded by Scottish Government to a degree. Uh, they're central to debates on the, the type of Scotland that we want to create. We have a strong anti-poverty sector. We've got reasonable data. We've got good links with government. Um, the nationalist politics, and I'm not party political and, and I've no desire to, to be, but the nationalist politics in recent years, in my mind, has worked to the favour of those that want to tackle poverty. Because while some of the changes down south have been regressive, have been making things worse, the kickback to that in Scotland has been to pull back and to try to do things to ameliorate the impact of some of the, the changes that have been brought in down south. So to my mind, the nationalist politics in recent years have made things at least less poor for the very most vulnerable in Scotland. So education, tackling poverty, absolutely central to how Scotland views itself. And that's what we, uh, this is our collective national purpose. Um, increased wellbeing and inclusive growth. That idea about, you know, we're all in it together is something that we, we tend to believe in. So how does education fit into these things then? Well, that's a typical view of the, you know, the poverty cycle. And one of the kind of key drivers is significantly disadvantaged in education and skills. And you follow that through. If you've not got the skills, you won't get the job. You'll fail to escape poverty. You'll live in a family in poverty. The child grows up in poverty and so on. So we see poverty education has been one of the root causes of poverty for people who do not achieve through education. And we can flip that, of course. It can become a virtuous cycle. That if we can intervene in education, then perhaps the, the thinking goes that we can change that negative cycle into a virtuous one. And that's the attainment challenge thinking, of course. If we can only improve people's educational outcomes, it makes it much more likely that they themselves, through a, vari a variety of triggers that follow, uh, will live an adult life free of poverty. That's what we're working toward. So what about these hidden poverties then? Well, there are a few hidden poverties, I think, that are worth uh, acknowledging. Picture in poverty is, you know, what view of poverty do we have? I've thrown some statistics at you, I've given you a couple of charts, uh, I've talked around some broad issues, um, but the kind of view of poverty we have is very much like that. It's a middle-aged bloke with an a, a empty bottle in his hand who's, you know, drinking far too much and is to some extent the architect of his own problems. 
if we drill a little bit further, and I, I, you know, a couple of years ago I googled child poverty in Scotland and saw what the most dominant images were that came up. And these were the most dominant images that come up when we, when we Google child poverty uh, and, and Scotland. They're urban images. They're images of urban decay. They're images of absolute destitution. Um, they're images in, in terms of that top left-hand corner of super lazy journalism, because I don't know how many news articles I've seen that use that uh, image. And that building no longer exists. It's been pulled down long ago, but you'll probably see it in some news article over the course of uh, the next 12 months or so. It's an urban issue. We view it to be an urban issue. If, if, if at all we view it as a child issue, we view it as an urban issue, not a, not a real issue. So one hidden poverty certainly is that mindset of where poverty is. Poverty is in the very poorest parts of our cities is a, is a, a sense of our understanding, which means there's a hidden poverty beyond that, particularly for rural areas, but not just exclusively. I think small town poverty too. Um, some intense pockets of poverty are felt in some of our small towns uh, across the length and breadth of Scotland. And that's not in any way, shape or form to undermine the significance of the challenge in your Glasgow's and your Dundee's, pockets of Edinburgh and pockets of Aberdeen. Hidden poverty too, what Scots think about poverty in education. Now we're quite fortunate uh, in Scotland and the UK that we have a regular, fairly regular attitude survey. We, we test what people think about all manner of social issues. So we get an understanding of what the public temperature is. And the British Social Attitude Survey, which is a significant number of people in Scotland responding, occasionally ask people what they think about poverty. Uh, this question here then, you know, Scots accept that, in fact, this might have been taken not from the British Social Attitude, this particular data, this was for some work I did for STV a few years ago uh, as part of the Children's Appeal. And basically what we have here is an acceptance that Scots accepting that child poverty exists in Scotland. You know, the, the most common 55%, more than half of Scots believe there's quite a lot of child poverty in Scotland today, and the vast majority of the remainder think there's some child poverty. So we don't have to convince Scots that child poverty is on our doorstep. That's, that's one that it harks back to the points I made earlier. You know, we, we believe a sense of social justice. We acknowledge what the challenges are that are around us. Equally importantly, an overwhelming proportion of Scots think it's very important to do something about it. So four-fifths think it's very important to tackle child poverty. Now you take those last two attitudinal data together, that's a good base for any intervention that you want to do in terms of getting public support. We believe there's a problem and we think it's important to do something about it. Pulling the two together means that if you were, just to take these two uh, stats at face value, if you were to try to introduce a local initiative to tackle child poverty, you would expect public support because we get that it's a problem and we think it's important to do something about it. But, and there is a but, we also ask Scots who's got a role to play in tackling poverty and we don't know by the way the data are asked the extent to which education is important. I would like to see local government split up there and broken down into different services. It'd be interesting to find out and we don't know the proportion of people in Scotland that think that education has a role to play in tackling poverty as opposed to social work or community youth services or, or leisure services. We accord an, uh, quite a significant importance to education through the Achievement Challenge. We believe then it's got a key role to play, but we don't really know how important um, Scots think through the, the main way in which we collect public opinion. So that's a question mark. We're actually not too sure what the public are saying. But there's also some bad news. I do apologise for the minute detail here. I'll explain it to you. Um, the same attitudinal research asks people in the UK, Scotland part of that, what they think are the main reasons for child poverty. And they give them a whole long list of reasons and say, tick all of these reasons that you think contribute to child poverty. And then they give them the same long list of reasons and say, tick the one that you think is the very most important reason. So this there is a summary for Scotland, sorry, for the UK, for the very most important reason for child poverty. And you'll see that right at the top of the pile, their parents suffer from alcoholism, drug abuse, or other addictions is the number one reason we think, we think is the very most important reason for child poverty. That's what the British public think, and has consistently <coughs> been so for a number of decades. Proportions actually slightly went down, but it remains the most important reason, according to the British public, about why we have child poverty, blaming the individual for the circumstances in which they find themselves. Fourth on the list there is their parents lack education, 8%. So you might argue there's a good and a bad in that. You know, it's near the top of the list in terms of one of the reasons education is, relatively speaking, uh, understood to be one of the drivers, but it's far and away uh, less important relative to uh, blaming individuals according to alcoholism or drug abuse. That's the same data with, the, with both parts put together. 
The blue part is the proportion of those that say it's the very most important reason, and the additional red part is those that say it's a contributory factor. So if you take the top one together, alcoholism, drug abuse, then 82% of the British public are saying alcoholism or drug abuse contributes to um, uh, child poverty, and 21% of those, uh, or 21% of the total there, say it's the main reason. So 82% in all, taking the very most, plus others that think it's a contributory factor. And if we go down there, if we take this at face value, then only two-fifths of people uh, in, this is Scottish data, this one, two-fifths of people in Scotland think that a lack of education contributes to child poverty. Only two-fifths. Far, far more um, people can think that alcoholism and drug abuse contributes to it. Now, the point I'm making is, we are so wrapped up in understanding the role of education in tackling child poverty. We, we get the, the broader social challenges, we, we, we know what we can do in our doorstep in terms of attainment challenge to tackle it, but there are maybe hearts and minds to be one that this is a, a, an important strategy to use to tackle child poverty. There are perhaps many more in Scotland that would rather have different approaches using tackling different, maybe same populations or maybe a, a cohort of the population you're tackling, but tackling different problems to uh, deal with these fundamental causes which lead to uh, unequal education outcomes. So a second hidden poverty, just to recap the point I'm trying to make there, is that there's a lack of understanding about what the education in particular is in relation to poverty, but I think more generally what the drivers are of, of, of poverty. There's a misunderstanding, a hidden, um, hidden explanation for why poverty exists in Scotland. And I'm not saying that alcoholism, drug abuse and other addictions isn't a contributory factor. Of course it is. If you are so wrapped up and consumed by an addiction, then inevitably you're going to lose focus on your family. Inevitably, both in the money you spend directly on your addiction, but as well as the lack of focus you have for your family, it will be a contributory factor. But it's not the main factor. You know, it's not the main factor that accounts for 240,000 kids in Scotland living in poverty at the current time. That's a problem we have in terms of uh, overall focus. Hidden poverty three, education and anti-poverty strategy. Hidden to a degree. We are in Scotland just now committed to eradicate child poverty by 2030. That magic number, 2030, when Scotland will be a very different place to what it is just now, because every strategy works towards that, that end date. Uh, well, I've been a little bit flippant. Um, it's good to have something to work towards. I think the reality is that we are not going to eradicate child poverty by 2030 with a level of resource that we're directing at it just now. In the same way that if, we, if we're being fundamentally Sorry, if I've been quite frank about it and speaking candidly, we won't eradicate the attainment gap with the amount of resource that's been directed at it just now. Now, I fundamentally believe that. I don't think it's necessarily a problem that we have the target. The same I don't think it's a problem we have the target of eradicating poverty. But we have to be realistic about what we can achieve. You know, if we are want to continue in the long term with the types of interventions that we have, attainment challenge, local strategies to tackle child poverty, we can't set ourselves up to fail. We have to be proportionate in our evaluations about what we can achieve and we have to acknowledge what success would look like, and as with child poverty, as with the attainment challenge. But each one of our 32 local areas in Scotland has, over the last 12 months, produced this local child poverty action report. Can I just do a straw poll, and it's not an embarrassment, try to catch them out. Hands up if anybody has read their local child poverty action report. Okay. We're about half. Half of us have done it. Okay. So we are key professionals, attainment challenge, narrowing the attainment gap. We think that would be a key element of a local strategy to tackle child poverty. And half of us have maybe read it, and I'm not going to dig at you. There's something to do with processes here. There's something to do with collective buy-in to these big strategies. Um, this is, happens to be out of our these strategy here. But your authority has one of these strategies, all except one authority in Scotland that I won't name, that's kind of dragging its heels and hasn't yet submitted its, stra its strategy. But we all are committed through the 2030 Act to have a local plan which says what we're going to be transformative locally, how we're going to do things differently local with, locally with the resources at our disposal to tackle child poverty. Very similar in, in outlook to the attainment gap. A local strategy, cross-sector, uh, also largely based in government but working in partnership with the health services but also involving third sector as well, what we'll do locally to transform poverty in our area. So the end game are big numbers, um, technical numbers about how we measure poverty. We want to get the numbers down. I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the details of exactly what that means, but in a nutshell, it's about getting the numbers down to a level that we think equals eradication. And the other drivers. Drivers are increasing income for employment, reducing cost of living, 
and ensuring that income from social security and benefits in kind uh, make a bigger difference than they are just now. now. You're going to hear from Sarah about some cost of living work that goes on in schools. Absolutely fundamental to reducing cost of living is the work that the Cost of the School Day project is encouraging schools at the length and the breadth of the country to do. So to me, a key aspect then of reducing costs is already going on in schools. It's reducing the hidden cost of education, targeting at least the, reducing the hidden cost of education in our schools. Absolutely central to how Scotland views how child poverty should be tackled is the work that should be going on in schools at, at the current time. There are certain groups of children that are, that are t we, we know the risk of poverty is higher, so that might be the same types of cohort we're interested in or we, we focus in more on the attainment challenge, it may not. I know that the trigger for attainment challenge, of course, is free school meal entitlement, but perhaps these are the populations that are more likely to be uh, users of free school meals. There's some, some issues to do with minority ethnic in terms of um, school meals, it's not quite as straightforward. Happy to discuss that one. And this is one example in the, 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 the um, aggregate report on Every Child, Every Chance, the National Child Poverty Strategy. Further support the cost of the school day is one of the strategies then that's been used to try and reduce the cost. So it's already acknowledged in the national document about how reducing costs of the school day are central to that broader effort of tackling poverty in Scotland. It's acknowledged nationally. And Future drivers of your free school meals take up, which is a kind of hobby horse of mine, it's another area I've got an, an interest in, it is one of the, the ways in which it's going to be looked that the, we can be more effective in schools by increasing the, the, the take up of free school meals, which for a variety of reasons is not as high as it should be at the current time. So a third hidden poverty might be, and I use a question mark, in your local authority, to what extent is the education work you're doing central to that local strategy towards tackling child poverty? If you've not been consulted, why have you not been consulted? If you don't know about the document, then how can you find out about it? How can you make a difference? Because these are live documents over the course of 10 years which are meant to be transformative. They're not once and for all written in 2019 and carried through for 10 years. They have to change is according to realisation and, and uh, realisation of priorities, um, sh shapes and changes through time. So a third hidden poverty might be that education is not as prominent as it should be in the local strategy to tackle child poverty. A fourth hidden poverty that might be relevant to, to us is rural, rurality. Now some of us will be in primarily, primarily, primarily rural authorities, others will be in authorities that are mixed, that have a, a mix of urban and rural. But for many of us, rurality then is a dimension to uh, our um, local area. And in many ways then, we should acknowledge there is rural poverty. And the images I showed earlier show that we tend to view it as an urban problem. If the stats are presented, it tends to always emphasise that the poverty is in urban areas. But it's a significant challenge in rural Scotland. One in seven people in rural Scotland are estimated to be living uh, in poverty, uh, which is one in six of all people living in poverty in Scotland. OK, five-sixths of Scotland's poor population live in urban areas, but one-sixth of Scotland's poor population are living in rural areas. A significant proportion of people in rural areas, a significant minority of Scotland's poorest people um, likewise. That's a, that's a challenge to us though, and, and what you have here is looking at, according to um, one classification scheme, the Randall definition, these are the rural authorities in Scotland. And this is, again, the data are slightly out because it's not this current SIMD, Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, it's one further back. This is a proportion of an authority's income-deprived income -derived population who also live in the most deprived areas in Scotland. So income-deprived population in an authority, what proportion of them are living in the most deprived areas in Scotland? And you see for Shetland, Orkney and, and um, the, the Western Isles, it's none. Now that's not to say that there aren't any income deprived people in the three island authorities, it's simply there are not any um, Scottish index of multiple deprived areas that are considered to be Scotland's most deprived in these areas. So the income deprived don't show up in that particular metrics um, because they simply don't exist. The income deprived people are there, but there's not the aggregations which show in the SIMD hit list. And even in East Ayrshire, it's only two fifths of income deprived people in East Ayrshire, which is an interesting, largely rural, but it's got a large town of Kilmarnock in there as well, with many significant smaller uh, urban centres. But even in that area, only two fifths of income deprived people in East Ayrshire are also living in the most deprived areas. So in many authorities, 
the hidden dimension of poverty is a dispersed poverty. It's not a concentrated poverty. Each one, certainly each one of the, the rural authorities, there's more dispersal of poverty than there is concentration. A fourth dimension to the hidden poverty in Scotland. Fifth hidden dimension then, positioning education strategically an anti-poverty activity uh, that I've referred to. I think this is a big issue. What, what are we doing? Is it long term or short term? We deal with the here and now. We deal to try to improve kids' lives in the here and now, but the kind of thinking is the work that we do in terms of tackling poverty is a long term project. That the work we do in the here and now will reap its rewards further down the line. And that's difficult to measure. Uh, it's also sometimes difficult to contribute towards those broader efforts because the work that you do is, you know, the, the benefits of it aren't seen for, for quite some time. Is education a short term or a long term project in terms of tackling poverty? It also, tackling poverty generally can be many different things. I think this is really quite important. We tend to think of tackling poverty as a second bullet point. It's all about reducing the number of people living in poverty. That's what it's about. And you'd argue that's quite right. I mean, at the end of the day, you want fewer people to be living in poverty. It's, a, it's a, almost a common sense goal for tackling poverty. But if you think about it, think about the type of what you do in education, you have very little direct control over levers to stop people living in poverty. Yes, you can maybe reduce the cost of living a little, but you don't have full control of the levers that make a difference. You soften the blow, you maybe provide the potential for long-term transformation, but you can't really reduce a family's poverty in the here and now. You're not putting pounds and pence in their pocket that pull them up over a, <clears throat> a notional poverty line so they escape it. That's not what education's about. So if our anti-poverty strategy is all about reducing the number of people living in poverty, then it's difficult for us to see a central role for education as part of that bigger project. Rather, some of these other bullet points, in my mind, equally important bullet points, are where education fits in. Protecting those living in poverty from the worst excesses. A lot of what you do in education is exactly that. Protecting them from the worst excesses. Making sure that a kid that turns up to school who's not been fed gets food in the morning. That's protecting them from the worst excesses. I'm involved in a pilot project just now in, a, in an authority in Scotland that's evaluating a breakfast cart. It's been used in three schools. The breakfast cart is simply provided. The kids help themselves to food, uh, simple as that. If they want food, they take it. If they don't, they don't. The idea behind that is there's a hidden need. Children come to school hungry, uh, not able to fully concentrate on their education because of that hunger. So what the school's trying to do, and it's trying to evaluate to see whether it works, providing food without cost, without stigma, because any kid can take that food and see whether or not that protecting from the worst excess of poverty makes a difference. That's one of the examples that education can make a difference. Preventing people in the margins of poverty from falling into it, well, yes, to some extent, that's where cost of the living can make a difference. You know, just providing that little bit of safety net for, for people and families that are not in the depths of poverty, but maybe at risk of falling into it by taking away, making the pound stretch a little bit further, taking away some of the costs that otherwise they would have. Enabling people living in poverty to increase their chances of living a poverty-free life is a long-term education vision. That's what we're kind of getting at through attainment challenge, narrowing the attainment gap. That what we try to do then is enable a generation of children who might not achieve, might not have um, outcomes from education that are positive, to have more positive outcomes that mean in the longer term uh, they are less likely to live in poverty themselves. So we see with the, even those three points that I've made there, it's quite complex, it's multi-dimensional, the interventions of education and tackling poverty. But it's not really about reducing the number. It's about everything round about that. And I think if we think strategically about it, we have to acknowledge that. We have to value it. It has to be part of our local vision about what your local area wants to do to tackle poverty. It's not just about reducing numbers, but it's both a short-term and a long-term strategy that's dealing with crisis at the current time, but leaving the, uh, laying the foundations for more transformative work in the longer term. So just by way of conclusion, a couple of questions for you. Not a couple, three, can't count. Throw a bonus one in there as well. Are our anti, existing anti-poverty interventions in school working? That's a question we've got to ask ourselves because it's a question that's fundamental to the local child poverty action reports. Let's not just do what we've always done. Let's ask ourselves difficult questions. Whether the local authority spend is doing exactly what we think it is and whether it's as effective as it might be or is it less effective in alternative ways of um, introducing that spend. These are some data. Um, on 2018, so one year out of date, um, uptake of free school meals in primary schools in uh, three authorities from the north, Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire uh, and Murray. And this is a proportion then of children 
who are present and registered for free school meals who actually took a free school meal on the census survey day in 2018. And so we see that in one of these schools then fewer than half of the children in the primary school that were registered and entitled to that free school meal actually took it on the survey day. Now there are many reasons why there might be a fall through. You know, it's a quirk, the, the census, I'm sure you're aware that the, the free school meal census, it can be things simply such as we had a school outing that day and they weren't available there to take it. But by and large it's not. By and large there are you know, other problematic reasons why kids are not availing themselves of free school meals. And just in these, some of them rural, some of them city authorities, we can see that a significant proportion of children that we think should be getting a free school meal for a variety of reasons are not getting free school meals. And if that figure is typical of the school year, that adds up to a lot of children not, not getting the food that we expect them to be getting as a result of free school meal provision. And in secondary schools, it's, it's the, the, the data are worse because we know that in secondary schools, more kids take the choice not to have the free school meal, they get out of the school environment. They find money, uh, receive money from parents and spend that uh, in, in local retail establishments. You know, fewer than one or just over one third of kids in one of these schools, secondary schools, actually getting a free school meal on the survey day. And you know, I just happened to pick um, three authorities there. The same applies throughout the length and breadth of Scotland. It's slightly worse in Edinburgh uh, than, than any other areas. That's got the lowest um, uptake of people that are entitled to free school meals that actually avail themselves of it. That should lead us to ask difficult questions. Fundamentally, free school meals are not doing what we want it to do for a significant proportion of children, so what can we do to make it better? Or indeed, the more difficult question, do we scrap school meals altogether and think of some other way of getting food to kids that are living in poverty? That's the type of question we should be asking. I'm not saying it's an obvious solution that comes from it. There's probably multiple solutions that have to be done, but we have to be critical about what we think is working and ask ourselves whether we could do things better and differently. And we're doing some work, um, we worked with Assist FM, the Assist Facilities Management. We're currently doing a small project uh, through the, the Poverty and Inequalities Commission that's looking at some of the schools that are bucking the trend. The reality in regard to free school meals, that one particular issue is in Scotland at the current time, the proportion of kids in the last three years who are entitled to a free school meal uh, and are registered for it has been going down the uptake. So we're looking at schools that are bucked the trend talking to the catering staff, talking to the school education management to try to find out what's going on in that school to, to um, reverse the trend or to, um, to have an alternative uh, direction of travel to the prevailing one in Scotland. What role for children? Do we really know what they think and want? If we're in education, it's all about enabling children to achieve we, you know, the, the, the thinking that's fundamental to Scotland, the children's rights, a, a human rights approach to tackling poverty, something that the anti-poverty selector firmly believes in. And I think we have to involve children in this, not just do it to them, but understand from their viewpoint um, what, how they experience free school meals, how they experience after school activity, how they experience uh, being able to participate in the classroom, how they experience school uniforms, etc, etc. There's a role from gathering that information from children and reflecting and learning from that. And there's a quirky example here, and it's perhaps not the very best example, but I, I like it anyway. Uh, last year, down south outside Manchester, um, the, the um, local children's uh, road safety officers gave parking tickets, fake parking tickets, to parents who were parking outside the school gates. So they took it upon themselves, well, with a little bit of help from the head teacher, uh, to put on the, the, the windscreen of cars that were parking in a manner that was dangerous to, to them, uh, fake parking tickets to get the point across that the irresponsible parking of parents was a danger to children uh, outside their school. Now, there are different ways in which children can be active. We, we've seen the environmental action of children in, in, in recent months, and the, not yet transformative, but potentially transformative in how we think about and act in environmental issues. I think there's a much more active role we have to have for children in thinking through issues to do with poverty and justice. And certainly that little bit of research I referred to we're doing just now with the breakfast cart, there's a real sense of collective responsibility uh, amongst the kids, and not just kids that were using the breakfast cart service, but an awareness of how other kids need that service or how other families need that service. It's there. There are you know, a supportive resource, I think, that should be drawn upon if we want to create more socially just schools. Not just a source of problem, but really a source of solution. And a third question, what role for educational practitioners? Now, 
I don't think we can assume that every teacher in Scotland thinks the same way. I think there's a little bit of hearts and minds to be won, but there's some good work out there that is making a difference. Certainly, again, I keep plugging Sarah, and the cost of the school day work is, is undoubtedly the case. There's work going on in Edinburgh um, <clears throat> as well, one, one variation of that. But there's also some work done by the, the, the unions, um, EIS, the union in particular, a, a lovely little document, Face Up to Child Poverty, it was a very simple document, part of their um, Face Up to Child Poverty campaign, which gives concrete examples of how educational practitioners of different ilks can do things in terms of their everyday practice that can make sure that poverty is less of a problem. Um, that's not a case of, you know, like take a spare apple to school to feed a kid. You know, there are other things in terms of the routine business of education. If you're giving out homework, make sure that you're not assuming that all kids have access to the internet, otherwise you are inadvertently disadvantaging, uh, disadvantaging kids um, who may not have as, as ready access as others. Small things that we can do, taking for granted things that can change what we're about. And I know the AIS have followed on this with support from the Scottish Government. They have the PACT project just now, which is looking at then transformative practice with communities and in schools to try to change the way in which the school is inadvertently creating problems or is not as effective at dealing with the problems of poverty in the classroom. So, conclusion then, Five di di uh, dimensions of hidden poverty. It's not your problem, it's everybody's problem. I, I, I firmly believe that everybody in Scotland, you know, as individuals or as professionals, whatever domain you work in, there are things that you can do that can make a difference. They alone won't be transformative, but I think we've all got responsibility within our domains of interest to do what we can more effectively in order to tackle poverty in Scotland. And I'm very happy to have a, a conversation, if we've got time, about um, the role of education in that. Thank you.